a cosmic Christ in John's Gospel. Questions from our last discussion. What are the meanings of apocalypticism, gospel, Christ, baptism, parable, metanoia, and ecclesia? What is the basic outline of Jesus' life and ministry in the synoptic gospels? What does Mark's Gospel have to do with the fall of the Temple and the destruction of the Judean Temple cult? Part 1. Christology Last time, we discussed the first Gospels that survived to us, the Synoptics, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. These aren't the oldest Christian literatures, but rather, they're the oldest narrative accounts of Jesus' career and death. The first of these, the Gospel according to Mark, appeared in the immediate aftermath of the Second Temple's destruction. And because of that, Mark posited Jesus as the replacement of the Temple cult. The connection between God and humanity appears to have been broken because the Temple is no more. But that isn't true. A new kind of cult, the cult of Jesus the Messiah, has replaced the cult of the Jerusalem temple. But, like a temple cult, the cult of Jesus has inner mysteries. If you're outside of the cult, all you see are stories, the stories of Jesus himself and the stories that he told, the parables. To the outsider, the message is like a secret. But if you've been initiated, meaning that you've been baptized, had a metanoia, a change of mind, and eat the ritual food which Jesus himself is, then you see and understand more deeply. Then you will be in on the secret, the mystery. If you participate in the myths, then you'll get it. Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, but not in the mundane political senses of those terms. Those roles are much more than political. And Jesus is the Son of Man, but not just a mere human being, something apocalyptic, a human who reveals something that's more than human. The Messiah, the Son of God, this Son of Man, is the new temple. And like the second temple, he will be destroyed. But unlike that temple which is made out of stone, this living temple will be restored again in his resurrection. Jesus will last forever. This topic of who and what the Messiah is precisely is later going to be called Christology, the study of Christness, of Messiahness. It isn't just a study of Jesus, but rather the study of the reality of Jesus. What does it mean to say that Jesus is the Messiah? What does it mean to say that Jesus is the Son of God, or the Son of Man? So, Mark's Christology says that the Messiah is not a political figure, as most, if not all, Judeans at that time would have expected. But rather, the Messiah is a replacement for the temple cult. The Christ is a person who is sent by God to restore or replace the temple cult with a personality cult. Matthew and Luke who both revised Mark, agree, roughly, with that Christology. They have many more stories about Jesus, like the stories of his birth and visions of him after the resurrection. And they also have more stories by Jesus, more preaching and many more parables. But their Christology, their interpretation of Messiahhood, are quite similar to Mark's. But there were other early Christian communities who approached Christology in different ways. It isn't that they disagreed with the Synoptic Gospels and the communities that created them, but more that they probably just didn't know about them. They received orally some of the same stories from and about Jesus that the authors of Matthew, Mark, and Luke did, and they also received some stories that the Synoptics didn't. But they explained Christology in their own terms, 
drawing out the themes and meanings as they understood them. Another of these communities created the gospel attributed to someone named John. Now again, it isn't clear who this John is or where this particular Christian community was in the Roman world. This gospel was written a little later than the synoptics, but like them, John was written in Greek. It's usually dated to between the years 90 and 110 of the Christian calendar. Like the synoptics, the primary audience of John's gospel were Judeans, or at least people whose ancestors were Judeans. But by this time, the temple had been destroyed for at least a generation or two. Few people in John's audience would have any memory of the Jerusalem temple themselves, and even fewer would have been old enough to have participated in that cult as adults. In fact, by the time John's gospel appeared in this Christian community, we can suppose that some people in John's primary audience had been Christians for perhaps a generation, maybe two. Part 2. John's Prologue At the start of John's Gospel is his famous introduction, his prologue. John's Gospel opens in a way totally unlike the synoptics. Mark begins with the adult Jesus encountering John the Baptist. Matthew and Luke go a little further back with stories of Jesus' ancestry and birth. But John goes even further back, much, much further back, before the creation of the world, in fact. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Gospel starts in the beginning. But this doesn't mean the start of Jesus' ministry or even at his birth, but rather at the very beginning of time. And by the way, the Greek translations of the Torah start with that exact same phrase, in the beginning. So, already, the audience would know that this means at the very beginning of the world. Then we're told that there was a word in the beginning, and this word was with God, and this word was God. In Greek, the term here translated as word is logos, and we're going to learn later that Jesus himself is this logos. Logos is a notoriously difficult word to translate, because it means a lot of things at once. It does mean word, a part of speech. And so, if we render logos as most translators of John do, as word, Jesus is something that God spoke in the beginning. And yet that speech act is God. But logos means a lot of other things, too, all at the same time. Logos can mean reasoning, as in how one thinks, hence the word logic. So Jesus is like God's plan or order for things. God from all eternity had reasoned things out, and the name for that reason is Jesus. And that reasoning is also God himself. Logos can mean meaning, as in the true nature of something, or how something should be understood. So then, Jesus is the meaning of things, and the meaning of things is God. Or, logos can be an account of something, like when we say, what's the word on that situation? So in that sense, Jesus is like a testimonial. So, in the beginning was this testimonial, this testimony about God, and that testimony, that account, was God himself. And so, according to John's Gospel, Jesus is God, somehow. He is God's Logos, and yet that Logos is also God. The Messiah, the one sent by God, is also God. And what about 
Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. The Logos, Jesus, is God, and God is the creator of the world. But somehow, God also created through Jesus. What does that mean? How does God create through Jesus, who is also God? Now, right away, this is a very different Christology than Mark and the other synoptics had. Now, remember, John's author probably didn't know about the synoptic gospels, so it isn't so much that he's disagreeing with them, is that he's approaching Christology in a different way. But if you know about modern forms of Christianity, then you'll know that modern Christians affirm the truth of both Mark and John's Gospels. And so they developed ways to reconcile these Christologies. But that's discussion for another day. The prologue continues. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. Now the prologue is talking about John the Baptist. So we just jumped from the dawn of time with Jesus as the divine logos that had the world made through him, all the way to a very certain moment in history. Here is a prophet, a human being, who is sent by God to act as a witness. And again, we're going to have to break out the Greek dictionary. The word witness is martyrs, a martyr. A martyr is someone who is persecuted and usually dies for a cause. Now, the Synoptic Gospels, as well as John's Gospel here, mention that John the Baptist would be killed by the Judean aristocrats. But for the Gospel of John, the Baptist's martyrdom, his witness, is particularly significant. To say that someone is a witness is to say that they have seen something and they are giving witness to it. The prologue goes on. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, Those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the prologue jumps back to talking about Jesus again. But now it's not just the Logos, which existed before the creation of the world, but Jesus is now a light that is coming into the world. He came to his own, meaning his own people, but they did not receive him. But some people did receive him, just not his own people. This is our first clue that there's a growing gap between John's community, whoever they were, and the adherents of the temple cult in Judea two or three generations back. This passage should be understood to say that the community that this gospel is speaking to, their ancestors rejected Jesus, but now they do not. Therefore, this new community would become like God's own children, although not in a biological sense. How does this work? The Word, the Logos, became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. The word flesh here is critical. When John's Gospel says that the Word became flesh, it doesn't just mean that the Word, Jesus, took up a human form, although it does mean that. But when it says flesh, it means flesh. The word, sarx, does not just mean a body, it means meat. It's an edible part of a body, the flesh of a body. So when the prologue says the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us, it doesn't just mean that Jesus became a person and stayed with people for a while. It means that this divine logos turned into something that can be eaten 
and therefore dwells in the one who eats it. And if you remember from the synoptics last time, Jesus said specifically that his body and blood had to be consumed as part of his cult. John's Gospel is suggesting something similar here. Moving on to the end of the prologue. John testified concerning him. He cried out, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And now we come back to John the Baptist again. The Baptist foretold the coming of Jesus at some point, and he specifically said that Jesus is greater than he himself is, because he was before him. Well, already, as the prologue told us, Jesus was present as the Logos even before the world began. He was always there, because he is divine. But then, there also seems to be some distinction between the God being spoken of as the Father and Jesus as God's Son. Now, the synoptics call Jesus God's Son too, but here, any political implication of the Son of God isn't even really that important. In Mark and the other synoptics, people mistook the Son of God as a political role, when in truth, this title meant Jesus is the one who is the mystery, the one who must be participated in. John's Gospel agrees with this apocalyptic role. No one has ever seen God. God is veiled, hidden. But as God's Son in Logos, Jesus the Messiah makes him known. Part 3. John Contrasted to the Synoptics Like the Synoptics, John's Gospel has Jesus' ministry begin with an encounter with John the Baptist. But here, we're given some different details. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the Synoptics, John was baptizing people to wash away their sins. But here, it's Jesus who takes away sin. And John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God. We have to take this to mean a sacrificial lamb, the kind of lamb that you would sacrifice at the Jerusalem temple, or the lamb that would be sacrificed for a Passover meal. Again, Jesus is likened to food. But Unlike in Mark, where there's a secret that Jesus himself reveals during the Passover, in this gospel, it's proclaimed loud and clear from the very beginning of Jesus' mystery. Jesus is not a secret. John the Baptist knows who he is. Likewise, in Mark's gospel, Jesus alone sees a vision where God's spirit in the form of a dove comes down upon him. Now, in John's gospel, this is a public event. John the Baptist sees and tells everyone about it. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. There are no more secrets. Jesus does not tell John to be quiet. The truth of Jesus isn't just some private understanding for an initiated few. It's something that everyone should know and can be spoken about openly. And not coincidentally, John's gospel never even depicts Jesus being baptized. The mystery of Jesus is exposed directly and for everyone not just for some inner circle of people who received the baptism. The other parts of the synoptic mystery cult are often missing, too. In the synoptics, Jesus taught the public in parables, symbolic stories, 
that were only explained directly to Jesus' close disciples. John's Gospel barely has any parables at all. And in the synoptics, Jesus spoke just to his inner circle in deeply symbolic forms about how he was supposed to replace the temple cult. Here, in John, Jesus is much, much more direct about this. And again, he says it publicly. The Judeans then responded to Jesus, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. John's Gospel isn't interested in secrets, symbolic stories, or mysteries. Jesus here just spells everything out for whoever he is speaking to at the given moment. For another example, here he encounters a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who is both a stranger and a public official. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Judean ruling council. He came to see Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Before he even meets Jesus, Nicodemus, this political official, already knows who Jesus really is. He believes in his mission and knows that God's kingdom is not some political claim. This is all public knowledge in John's Gospel. And notice that Nicodemus has not even been initiated into Jesus' cult. But yet he's been born again. He's been given a new life. And he can now see the kingdom of God, even though he's never met Jesus before. Nicodemus just believes. Part 4. John's Soteriology John's Gospel isn't primarily just talking about having some cultic experience, but rather coming to believe that certain information is true. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has offered up his only son as a sacrifice, like a Passover lamb. And this son is also divine himself. These are straightforward claims about ultimate reality. John's Gospel is pulling no punches. If you want to win eternal life, you just have to believe in these truths, and these truths can be said directly. John's Gospel in that way is much more about orthodoxy. You must hold the correct opinions about God and how God works. The synoptics, on the whole, are much more interested in orthopraxy. You have to experience and do certain things. Rituals, initiations like baptism, and practice moral systems like the ones we saw in the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. Now, it isn't that John isn't interested in orthopraxy, or vice versa, that the synoptics don't care about orthodoxy. It's just that they prioritize them quite differently. The Gospel of John's Jesus even asks his disciples themselves about this. What works are they supposed to do? But he then tells them it's not about practices, but knowledge, a certain set of beliefs that they need to have. The disciples asked him, What must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. For John's proper belief, affirming certain information over others takes priority over practice. Right practice can only come from right belief. For John and his audience, people are sinful. But the correction of this isn't to just stop sinning, but rather to hold correct opinions. The thing that saves you is what you think. Right actions come later. The question of how one escapes from sin 
is called soteriology. Literally, the discourse or study of what saves you and what it is that you're being saved from. For John, sin is an ever-present reality of this world. Everyone is ensnared by sin. But if you know the truth, you will be saved from sin. You have to know, that is, think and believe, that Jesus himself is the truth, as well as the one who brings the truth. To the Judeans who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we've never been the slaves of anyone. How can you say that we'll be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. People, here the Judeans, think that sins means sinful actions. But Jesus isn't just talking about what people do, but what people know. You have to not only avoid doing evil things, you need to believe in the good things, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that means that Jesus is God. So not only do you have to follow the Messiah, you need to mentally affirm what that entails. That's how you escape sin and death. Consider the famous story of Lazarus, which only appears in John's Gospel. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus who had died. Distraught, Lazarus' sister Martha spoke to Jesus about her loss. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And then, sure enough, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But notice that Lazarus didn't actually do anything. He was dead. But Martha believed in the resurrection of the dead at the end of time. But when she actually said that she believed in Jesus specifically, that Jesus himself was that resurrection of the dead, then Lazarus could live again. Remember how the prologue mentioned that no one had ever seen God? John will go on to say that this is the only way to see God. The only way to be delivered from death is by knowing and believing in Jesus himself. And even then, Jesus needs to be known in a very specific way. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. John's Gospel is very explicit that Jesus and God have a unique relationship. Jesus alone can see and know God. He is the only Messiah and the only Son of God. And therefore, the only way to come to God, to escape sin and death, is to know this. And one needs not only to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, but one has to believe in exactly what that means. For John, this means that Jesus is himself God because he was offered up as a sacrifice that defeats sin. And so, to live in the proper relationship with God, one has to know that Jesus died and then is resurrected from the dead. That is very specific information that is required of the believer. They have to not only follow Jesus, they must mentally affirm a certain number of very specific things about him, and only then will they come into contact with God. There's a famous scene in John's Gospel that explains the point. After Jesus is crucified, he rises from the dead. Now that happens in all the Gospels, but in John, 
The encounters with the risen Christ are important because they offer correct information about God, as opposed to into the synoptics, where Jesus' resurrection is addressed more like a cultic mystery that one has to come to understand. So alone in John do we have the story of Thomas. Now Thomas is one of Jesus' inner circle of twelve disciples, right? so he's already an initiate. But Thomas wasn't there when the resurrected Jesus first appeared to his close followers, so he doesn't believe what they've said about him. But then, a week later, Jesus' disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Only when Thomas actually sees that Jesus is in the flesh and alive again does he correctly identify him as my Lord and my God. To know the resurrected Jesus is to know God. But it isn't that experience that saved Thomas. Remember, he was already part of Jesus' inner circle. It was correct knowledge that was saving. Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You don't need to see Jesus resurrected in the flesh, but you do have to believe in him. John's Gospel even ends on this issue. You don't actually need to have an experience. You need to have a belief. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This topic is going to continue on when we start discussing other Christian literatures next time. But meanwhile, be sure you can answer these following questions for class. Define martyr, Christology, Logos, Sarx, and Soteriology. What are the many claims of the prologue to John's Gospel? What is the gospel according to John's soteriology? <laughs>